Francis Donald is uh, chief economist with Manulife Investment. Uh, Francis, we also, of course, this week will hear from uh, Jay Powell. That'll happen tomorrow. And, you know, I guess maybe, I don't know if, they, if the central bankers can start to put these messages on rinse and repeat, but I, I feel like that's what we're going to get. We've done everything we can. We'll keep doing what we are doing, but it's really about the fiscal. Well, well put. Central banks don't really have to do much right now. They've contributed huge amounts of stimulus. They've managed to avoid a financial crisis, a credit crisis, and now rates are fairly well contained in the bond market. Actually, so little volatility that it's hard to actually find a rates trade out there. But there was one big development last month, and that was that Chair Powell of the Federal Reserve told us they are officially moving towards average inflation targeting. They are now going to target 2% over a longer period of time, which means that they'll actually allow higher than 2% inflation. Now, in a world where we don't have higher than 2% inflation, that's sort of a moot point. But this is a world where we're starting to see some inflationary pressure start to build. And that transition in the way they think about the world could actually start to matter a little bit more. So we will be watching, markets will be watching tomorrow to see how Fed Chair Powell actually qualifies that story a little bit more. And I mean, to your point, in some ways this is academic, but of course it, it'll be academic until it's not. Uh, and therefore there will be those who will try to uh, understand how this is going to play out, but specifically the bond market. How does this affect or change thinking in the bond market? So typically, traditionally, if we began to see inflationary pressure start to come up, especially as they got closer to 2%, you would see the market price in higher interest rates because traditionally central banks would respond by hiking. But now that the central banks are telling us, you know what, we got inflation wrong for so long, we're actually going to allow more inflationary pressures before we start hiking rates again. It means that we could actually see inflation get up to 3% before the bond market starts to price, price in higher rates. So effectively, what does this all translate to? It means that regardless of what happens in the next three to five years, we're probably at base bottom interest rates for that whole period, even if we see inflation move higher. That really is a game changer. It means our traditional relationship between interest rates and inflation is really diverging. I'm not going to say it's broken, hmm. but the line between them is changing quite a bit here. One piece of the equity market we know that's so important has been this uh, the kind of low rates and the promise of continued low rates, drawing more and more people into those uh, riskier assets. Get, I'd love your reflection on what we've seen recently, which felt like you know a pull off uh, from a very high point, but it doesn't feel as though Francis, uh, at least to me, that that it has any kind of uh, that there's any kind of commitment behind the pullback. Uh, people really do seem to want to stay in the market and keep buying. Well, what choice do you have? If you're a large institutional money manager, a pension fund, you got to make six to seven percent out there. You cannot do it in global government bonds. You have to move further out the risk curve. You have no choice. Now, that said, markets don't typically go up in a straight line. That's why we need people who could look at it and say there's too much good news priced in. We're in for some turbulence. We do need to watch for signs that the market is overbought as it has been. And we do have to watch individual sectors like the tech sector in the United States, which now is almost a third of the S&P 500. We have to watch for idiosyncrasies underlying the surface. Uh, this is a complicated market, even more so than it has been historically. Am I willing to put on a big short? Probably not in this environment. We still have central banks that are really trying to provide that policy put. We still have the promise of a vaccine. Our dreams of that have not yet been shattered. But volatility along the way is to be expected. I suspect we're going to see it for a couple more weeks here. It is the vaccine, of course, that does seem to be um, at least sort of at the at the very top of the market, if you will, the kind of frothy day trading aspect of the market, uh, changing sentiment. You know, do we get it by the end of this year? Do we get it by the end of next year? Are we looking much further out? Um, what it, when we think about sort of what's priced in and, you know, I care less about Robin Hood traders and what they're thinking today than about, you know, what an ordinary business is thinking, a restaurant that's trying to figure out can they survive long enough to reopen uh, and get fully back to normal, which probably Probably does mean a vaccine. What? Where do you think the rational place to think about this might be? It's a clever question, and actually, we spent a lot of time this week on my team and at Manulife talking about the value of the vaccine and do we really need it? Are we in an environment of vaccine or bust? Do we need a vaccine to get back to pre-COVID life if that even exists anymore? And increasingly, what we're seeing, especially because we've seen a dramatic surge in cases in places like Spain is that really what we need to be monitoring is not so much the vaccine, but those hospitalization rates and those mortality rates. If those are much lower, then we have more confidence that governments are going to pull back on social
social distancing requirements. What are we really asking for with a vaccine? We're asking for two things, that we no longer have to social distance and people have confidence going back out in the economy and using it. We need supply to come back online and we need demand to come back online. That may not necessarily be only via a vaccine. We may see incremental improvements on both those fronts from just evidence that the virus is perhaps not as painful now that it was earlier or that hospitalization rates are falling. So our conversation has become a lot more nuanced, nuanced on this. It is no longer binary vaccine or not. All right, and Francis, I do have to break a little news here, and I'll get your thoughts on it, but uh, we do have a statement now from the USTR, uh, U.S. Trade Representative on Canadian aluminum. We were waiting, of course, today for retaliatory tariffs from uh, Christian Freeland and the Canadian government. The USTR appears to be walking back tariffs. It is now saying it will remove that 10% tariff on Canadian aluminum. The reason they're giving is that the uh, higher-than-normal volume that they were complaining about, they expect it to abate. So it leaves a wedge of a door open uh, if, of course, volumes don't hit some levels and they're giving month by month uh, tonnage that they consider to be the threshold. So it's not a, it's not a perfect uh, resolution here, Francis, but we should say uh, that it does appear that Canada has a victory here. This is probably backroom negotiations that has resulted in the U.S. walking away from the imposition of those $10 billion in tariffs and therefore the imposition of $3.6 billion of retaliatory tariffs Canada was considering uh, as soon as at least announcing today. Uh, Francis, I mean, obviously this trade relationship is massively important. It's disappointing that post-NAFTA uh, 2.0 we should even have to deal with this. But what do you make of this as a sign that, you know, there is still negotiating to be done here uh, and that, that the businesses that were going to be affected and the consumers will not be at least immediately? You know, when I say that we should expect volatility in markets, that a lot of good news is priced in, one of the elements in Canada, U.S., and globally is geopolitical risks. Now, we've gotten used to believing geopolitical risks mean U.S.-China trade tensions. No, there is a long list of geopolitical tensions that will rise and fall between now and year end, and particularly between now and the election. U.S.-Canada is one. What about Brexit risks? There are elements of this story that we've really pushed aside because we've been so distracted by the pandemic that are really fundamental inputs in the way we have to do economic forecasts and because of that, the way we should be valuing companies. So this is good news for Canada. I'm happy to hear that. All economists are going to cheer when tariffs are removed and not implemented. But should we be operating in a world where we no longer have to talk about tariffs or trade wars? No. Get used to it. Deglobalization is here. It will be a topic that we are talking about that you are breaking news to me on for years to come. I guess that's the, the unfortunate reality, um, which I guess goes hand in hand with just the sheer level of uncertainty. So I just want to actually get before we go, you're thinking these days about how much you think you might be revising. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about, you know, when we look at we heard the premier of Ontario saying yesterday, look, if these trends on COVID continue, we could shut down again. Obvious, but a reminder that the the real financial pain could be back to 100 percent from wherever it is now for many businesses. Does that change your thinking about your outlook here? Well, that's been part of our theory is that in the second half of the year, Canada, the U.S., a lot of countries face a stall out that we would incorporate a second wave of the virus. Now, remember, what I care about most of all is do people feel safe leaving their home and using the economy? And if we have a second wave and it impacts confidence, that is not going to be good. So for a long time, we've been talking about a second economic wave in Canada. We've been on that scene for several months now. That second economic wave is still something that we have to contend with. How bad is it going to be? Well, that depends on how much fiscal stimulus stays in the pipeline and what new fiscal packages we get. But we are so far from out of the woods at this one. We have to really stay focused on the fact that we are still in an economic recession, still in an economic and health crisis, and we got a ways to go before we can claim victory. Francis Donald, always good to have you with us. Appreciate it. Thanks for Francis Donald is chief economist at Manulife Investment Management. And 